Thank you very much, and thanks, Steve, for a really exciting talk. I thought that was terrific. Um, <clears throat> my name's Chris Johnson, and I'm... Well, I didn't know what to talk about, actually. Now, this is a change of title, and I've, I've changed it a few times. So I've decided I'll, I'll talk about the species that we can't eradicate, um, the ones that we're going to have to learn to live with. And these are going to be some stray thoughts, really, but they'll focus on two species that are terrifying, terrifying to land managers, the feral cat and deer, fallow deer. And the reason I, I say these species are so frightening is that we know from experience elsewhere that they can transform landscapes. Deer have demonstrated that in New Zealand, cats on mainland Australia. <clears throat> so the background to this is that we know that um, Australian ecosystems have been particularly affected by invasive species and they've been enormously damage, damaging to livelihoods and biodiversity. The first reaction to this problem is this one, we want to try and get rid of them if we possibly can. But that is usually impossible for the reasons that, that um, Stephen briefly alluded to. It's hard to eradicate a species once it's become established in a new place for three reasons. The first is immigration. If you reduce numbers in one place, um, you can get re-invasion from elsewhere. Um, evasion, you have to get them all, every last one and rebound. A population, when it's been reduced to low numbers, increases its capacity for recovery um, because you make the world beautiful for the, for the remaining individuals. There's plenty of food, plenty of space, plenty of resources, and they come back quickly. So eradication almost never works for established species. And that's true worldwide. And this, this is a picture of an animal that was eradicated from part of England. This is the, the koipu, or the nutria, or the river rat, a South American rodent that that escaped from fur farms in England back in the 1930s and became widespread but was successfully eradicated over most of East Anglia. Um, but other than that, successful eradication of established species has really only worked on small islands and we're quite good at that and I'm, I'm sure we'll hear more about that shortly. So what if we can't eradicate? What, what do we do? There are really three options. The first is do nothing and, and just learn to love them if we possibly can, or, or profit by them in some ways. And that's not flippant, because a lot of species that have invaded Australia are actually terrific animals. I've, I've, I've got a real soft spot for the brown hare, for example, which is a lovely creature that, that doesn't seem to do much harm. Um, but there are nasty ones as well. So for them, we can do targeted local control to protect high-value assets, if that's justified by the, um, the benefit-cost ratio, or we can manage across the range to try to hold density below some damage threshold, some point where the cost um, is not significant and where the cost of control is reasonable. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about those two strategies um, and give, give some examples from the two species that I referred to. Firstly, the, the feral cat. Um, now, the feral cat has been in Tasmania for a long time um, and it doesn't seem to have caused much harm but it has potential to do great damage and has elsewhere. For example, feral cats like to eat small mammals so um, increasing cat numbers can cause decline in small mammal populations potentially leading to extinction and that may well have happened over large parts of Tasmania, particularly in the dry sclerophyll forests and, and woodlands in the east where native small mammals are really quite rare and cats probably suppress them. And we can get a shift in state. If native rodents are reduced by cat predation, that can create an opportunity for invasive rodents like the black rat and the house mouse. And black rats and house mice are both much more resilient to cat predation than native rodents are because they have much higher reproductive potential. So we can get this kind of shift from a native to an invasive ecosystem. And once black rats are established, it's really hard to get rid of them. Um, cats prey on vulnerable localised wildlife. If, if you can see the whole of this picture, what it shows is uh, a cat on Mariah Island creeping up on a mutton bird, a, a, a shearwater, in, in the front of the photo. Um, and this is taken from the Honours Project that Jenny Lewis is currently doing with Vince and Eric and, and other people, showing the impact of cats on seabirds there. Um, cats also harbour disease. Um, some data here from a paper soon to be published by Bronwyn Fancourt showing the prevalence of the disease toxoplasmosis in cats across Tasmania. And the rates of to toxoplasmosis in Tasmanian cats are close to the highest in the world for any wild cat population. 
And that's a serious problem because toxoplasmosis can infect native wildlife and to some species it's, it's lethal. Toxo can infect livestock and humans as well and it has all sorts of sort of complicated and, and really quite horrific health impacts on humans. And, and let me tell you also that the, the incidence of, of toxoplasmosis in the human population of Tasmania is among the highest in the world. Okay, so the cat problem in Tasmania is an old one, but it might be emerging, might be sort of rising to a new level, perhaps as a consequence of the decline of the Tasmanian devil. And this is still quite unclear. So let me just point out that these data here from one part of Tasmania, and we're not yet seeing this through the whole state, but it's possible that it will unfold as the devils continue to decline. Up in the northeast, where the facial tumour disease has been present longest and where devils declined in the 1990s, there is evidence for an increased something, activity or abundance, at least increased sighting rate of feral cats, and that's been followed in that area by decline of the eastern quoll. Now, that's... Um, well, it's, a, it's correlational evidence that, that cats play some part in the decline of quolls. And this is something that is being examined in, in much more detail now by Bronwyn Fancourt, who is getting evidence um, that cats, if, if not the cause of decline, are certainly suppressing eastern quolls in Tasmania. Just one example here. This is Bruny Island. Um, Bronwyn recently did camera surveys of south and north Bruny Island. There are no quolls, effectively, on south Bruny Island but cats are quite common at about the level that you would predict for the main island of Tasmania. In North Bruny Island, cats are rare. Um, they're very rarely seen, and Bronwyn picked up only one on a camera, and quolls. There's plenty of quolls, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of quolls. Um, so there's evidence here that, um, that uh, high cat numbers suppress quolls and low cat numbers allow quolls to persist. <coughs> So we should do something about cats. And the obvious thing to do is to try to reduce cat numbers because reducing cat numbers should reduce cat impact. But this is extremely hard to do. Um, cats are very, very difficult to, uh, to remove from the wild by any of the methods that we normally try, trapping, shooting, poisoning. And those, met those at attempts to do this can backfire. And that was shown in an experiment run by Billy Lazenby during her PhD who Billy was looking at the impact of cats on small mammals in southern Tasmania. Um, she went to six sites. At three of those sites, she removed cats, as many as she possibly could, to try to suppress the population. And she compared those to another th three sites that were controls, where she did no removals. And the result was that where she was removing cats, the abundance of cats went up. There were more cats. This is very interesting, and this has been seen elsewhere. Probably what's going on is that taking out established territorial adult cats just makes more room available for, 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 for immigrants who are often younger animals, and at least for a time, they establish it at higher density. So attempting to remove cats can create the perverse outcome where you end up with a higher density, and in that case, a bigger impact on small mammals. It's a little bit like the problem that, that Hercules had um, battling the hydra, the, the, the monster with the many heads, and when he cut one head off, two would grow in its place. So cats um, <laughs> are similar. <laughs> so what do we do about cats? We have to think differently, and um, I'm going to tell you now about some options for management of cats using ecological methods, ecological control of feral cats. Um, First is, is a little story from the PhD work of Hugh McGregor and honours work of Lily Lay, who are UTAS students working in the Kimberley in northern Australia, where, again, cats are an emerging problem and appear to be driving small mammal declines across large areas of the north. Um, Hugh was trapping cats in the Kimberley, where they're really tough, and radio tracking them, also sticking GPS tracking collars on them. And this is now the biggest tracking study of cats that's been undertaken anywhere in Australia, certainly. He's tracked something like 60 cats successfully. And the GPS collars give beautiful, highly resolved data on where cats move and, and how they make decisions about, about where to go to hunt. And it turns out that a really important factor influencing um, where cats hunt is fire. Cats like to hunt along the edges of hot burns. So, in a situation like this, cats tend to move to that black fire edge. This is a fire scar about two months old. And the, the amazing thing about this is that 
um, they go a long way. Hugh has had individual cats moving 15 kilometres to hunt for a short period around a fire scar and then return to their territory, even though the territory is only about three kilometres across. So those cats have to cross other territories to get to this fire scar. And we did an experimental burn through Lily's honours that showed that predation, the kill rates on small mammals after fire go up as a result of the increased activity of cats. So fire is bad for cats. So we can manage cats by managing fire in that instance, either by reducing the incidence of fire or changing the pattern of fire to make it less um, favourable to cats. We can protect small mammals by reducing the hunting effectiveness of cats. And if we reduce the hunting effectiveness of cats, we can reduce ultimately their population. Second possibility would be to restore a bigger predator um, to exert some control over feral cats. So <clears throat> we've seen some evidence now that decline in the devil population was associated with increase in cats in some sense, increased abundance or change in behaviour. So reinstating devils may lead to a decline in cat population and recovery of small mammals, although how the introduced invasive small mammals would respond to that situation, we don't know. Um, so it's lucky that this is actually being done. Um, devils, as you know, have been recently introduced to Mariah Island and as part of, or in collaboration with the, the Save the Devil program, um, we myself, Meta Jones and others, are looking at the changes in cat populations on Mariah and the impact of cats on their prey. So we may know more about that. Now, and the, last, the third thing we can do to manage cats is to manage the prey that they depend on or the alternative prey to a native species. And uh, rabbits on Bruny Island could provide a really interesting example of how this could be done. Because not only are cats rare on North Bruny, rabbits are very rare as well, even though North Bruny looks like it should be really good habitat for rabbits. Why are rabbits rare on North Bruny? Possibly, possibly because of the, the very large number of eastern quolls at the moment. And there's historical data that shows that um, early in the history of, of invasion of Australia by Europeans and invasive species, when quolls were abundant, quolls prevented rabbits from establishing spotted tail quolls and northern and eastern quolls. So quolls, when they're abundant, might be able to suppress rabbits when they're rare. And when there aren't very many rabbits, you're unlikely to get very many cats, and when there aren't very many cats, that protects the quolls. So there's a nice virtuous circle operating. What would happen if rabbits increased? Probably cats would increase, and if cats increased, then maybe quolls would go down. So management of a situation on Bruny Island could consist of just ensuring that there is no increase in rabbits. Do something to manage rabbits. And if we wanted to translate that to another part of Tasmania, what we could do is control rabbits, control cats, put quolls in, and try and get this thing working in the direction that we want it to. And, and that might be a way of doing good management of cats on the main island of Tas Tasmania to replicate what may be going on on Bruny Island. And um, you know, people who know about this, like Bronwyn, will know that what I'm saying is highly speculative, but I think we should be thinking in this way. OK, now, to, to briefly finish, I'm going to talk about deer. And I'm not going to say terribly much about deer because, because Simon will, will take up the topic after me. But what I will say is that, that deer are a species where we can manage numbers. And that's been shown in New Zealand, where hunting, often with professional hunters involved, was really effective in reducing deer populations uh, across certainly large areas of the South Island. Because deer are, are reasonably big and reasonably visible and there are enough people there with an interest in, in shooting them, it's possible to have an impact population-wide. <clears throat> and the question there is, how many deer do we want? You know, if we want to control, we have to have some idea of what our target population size is, otherwise the control is, um, is pointless. You know, if we don't know what we're trying to achieve, then, then don't do it. <clears throat> Um, so, how many deer do we want? Well, part of the question, well, we have to start by thinking about how many deer there are. And on the state government website it says 20,000, 20,000 deer in Tasmania. That's probably an underestimate. How many might there be? Um, recently a few of us um, at the university 
built a population model of deer in Tasmania. And what we did was we took the present distribution and abundance of deer, as far as we could understand it or interpret it from, from, from um, government records and reports, and that's the current distribution of deer up on the map on the right. Then we modelled the potential for local population growth where deer exists and developed another model for the potential increase in geographic range in Tasmania. We got those two models talking to each other and then we ran them forward for 50 years to work out how many deer we could get in Tasmania under current management. And the short answer is it's an awful lot. If we think we've got a problem or a difficulty now with 20,000 deer, we could easily have a million in 50 years. And there's really um, there's sort of no reason to think that can't happen. And in fact, when we uh, modelled the effect of the current um, estimated offtake of deer in Tasmania, we found that it had no effect on that final number. So we would have to be harvesting deer at a much higher rate now if we want to frustrate this potential population increase. <clears throat> Another thing we produced was a map showing where deer are most likely to expand their range in Tasmania. So currently they occur in the sort of the Midlands and the, the east central part of Tasmania. There's potential for much further spread in the northeast, the central highlands, and across to the northwest as well. So this, these are the parts of Tasmania where prevention of spread by containment is a real possibility and should be done. And uh, it's, it's not really, well it is kind of being done I suspect at the moment in Tasmania, but not explicitly because deer management is so fraught with conflict that it's very, very difficult to come up with a clear objective that we're going to um, remove or, or, um, or suppress deer populations anywhere in the state. <clears throat> it could be done. Um, and as a kind of um, an example of, of, of how reduction of the deer population might actually work, I'm going to briefly tell you about what might be the most successful management program of an in invasive species in Australia over the last few decades. And that's another species that I actually quite like, camels in central Australia, which have, have recently been subject to a coordinated management program. And this was based on a clear idea of a target density. That's based on a relationship between the density of camels and the cost of their damage. In this case, the the damage cost to grazing businesses. And that goes up, obviously. You know, more camels do more damage and it costs more. And it's actually an exponential increase. So on the basis of that curve and other information about the sort of damage that camels can do at intermediate density, a target of 0.1 camels per square kilometre was identified. Above that, the damage cost begins to increase. So that's, that's quite a useful point to aim at. And you can read about it in this recent report on the results of, of feral camel management. <clears throat> what they did was adopted a nil tenure approach you know, across the whole of the camel range. No permits, no permits required. People just ag agree on, on a removal rate and then implement it. Um, they collaborated with all the landholders and stakeholders, which is a far more complicated problem in Central Australia than in Tasmania, because you've got indigenous landholders and, and, and graziers and four state and territory governments. They removed camels until they'd reached their target density uh, and they did that throughout the range but concentrating on, on targeted assets, places that are very sen sen sensitive to camel impact. And this worked very well, I think, so they got down to their target density and it should be possible to sustain that in the long term. So we could, we could do that for deer in Tasmania. Um, if we um, thought about it in a way that led us to an agreement on a target density for deer. And this is how we might do it, by firstly identifying the relationship between population density of deer and the damage they do in Tasmania, the cost to the environment and to farmers. And we don't actually know this, but we, we know the curve will go up like that. Probably it would go up exponentially. <clears throat> the situation is a bit more complicated here because deer have benefits as well, they have values. People like to hunt them and there is, a, I believe, a small market in deer products. So the value of deer is going to increase as well. But probably it'll have a different form. Um, deer, um, you don't need all that many deer to, to gain value from them and it doesn't, you know, the, the, the value that you gain from additional deer diminishes with population size because there aren't that many hunters and there, there aren't markets for them. <clears throat> And when we're in this region to the right of where those curves cross, deer are a big problem and there's a high incentive to reduce numbers 
and we should try to reduce them to about that population size there, whatever it is. And of course, we don't know what these curves look like at the moment, um, but I'd, I'd like to think that it wouldn't take that much effort to establish them and to come to some agreement on how many deer Tasmania wants or needs and then work out how to get to that target. And I will stop there, as I say, because we're going to hear more about deer in a minute. But I just want to thank those people and thank you for listening. Well, thanks to the previous speakers, I think all of whom have uh, raised a few points that I'll uh, uh, cover in this talk. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, a part of Tasmania that's a long way away, uh, but still a part of Tasmania, and um, a project to get rid of uh, remaining vertebrate pests on Macquarie Island has been underway for the last uh, seven or eight years. So I'll just run through um, a few aspects of that. Just for those of you who haven't swum that far, it's 1,500 kilometres from Hobart down to Macquarie Island, uh, the, and the nearest other uh, landmass, if you like, are the sub-Antarctic islands south of New Zealand. But under 13,000 hectares in area, and about 34k long. Uh, so, firstly, in the context of this current eradication program, uh, what was the problem? And um, so we had uh, three species of, of vertebrate uh, pests, rabbits, ship rats and house mice. And the problem is not necessarily the fact that they were there, it's uh, more a case of the, the impacts that, that they're having. So we're looking to, to really um, identify the impacts and manage those rather than just say, well, we don't like rabbits and rats, so we'll get rid of them. So here's some um, tussock in reasonably good condition next to a penguin colony, uh, admired by tourists. And uh, it's about... Um, uh, yeah, 15, 14 years ago, and within about four years, all of that tussock was pretty much buggered, um, and everything around it for thousands of hectares was uh, was looking pretty much like that. So the imp these are the sorts of impacts that we were seeing and, and uh, wanting to address. Um, this is not this is not a new prog um, problem. This uh, this is uh, a photo. If, it looks more like a, a paddock uh, or on a farm, but uh, again, it's an area um, coastal and therefore should be covered with, with tussock, etc. This is about 1958, um, so rabbit numbers were, were also very high uh, 60, 70 years ago. So we're, we're not talking about a, a new impact, we're just talking about uh, maybe um, advances and what we can do about it. Um, bit of an idea, I don't think the point is working. No, but um, if we look at the, uh, the higher parts of the, the red um, bars on the left, um, mid-1970s uh, mid rabbit numbers were thought to be quite a lot higher uh, even than, than they were uh, in the last 10 years. So again, uh, rabbit numbers have been cycling uh, quite a lot uh, over the last few decades. And um, the part down here... Uh, is, um, reflects the introduction of myxomatosis as a control tool in 1979 and then uh, low numbers pretty much through the 80s and 90s as myxomatosis was, was doing a pretty good job of, of keeping rabbit numbers um, under control. Um, so when, the, when uh, the sort of movement was getting underway to say, well, what, what are we going to do about these impacts, uh, one of the first things to do was say, well, um, what's everybody else done? Um, I didn't mention the impact of rats uh, in that, but uh, rat impacts were largely around what you don't see, which is a lot of burrowing seabirds clouding the sky at, at dusk as they come back in from the, from the ocean feeding. Um, so we looked at who had done what, and uh, Campbell Island, which is uh, very close relatively to Macquarie. Uh, Norway rats were eradicated from there. It's a similar sized island. Um, a whole suite of species eradicated from an island uh, just off Auckland in the Hauraki Gulf. Um, rats and cats from Raoul Island, um, rats from Rat Island in Alaska, and um, rabbits and rats, uh, also ship rats from St. Paul in the southern Indian Ocean. Might be a Malaysian airliner somewhere around there at the moment. Um, so uh, we're looking at, okay, well, we can see that other people have successfully managed these sort of problems. What, what are we going to be able to do about it? And um, as I say, it's, these, these are the types of impacts that we're, we're trying to um, address. That uh, image, uh, again, should be covered in, in lush tussock or, uh, or Macquarie Island cabbage, but it's not. It's just a, a warren. Um, 
again, very early on in this sort of process, um, we need to, to look at um, a few basic principles if you're going to try and eradicate something, and, and uh, Stephen referred to three of these, and here's a couple more. Um, we needed to assess the feasibility of eradicating rodents and rabbits from Macquarie Island against every single one of these and come up with the answer of yes. And if we couldn't, then we really um, would struggle to convince governments that they should plough a lot of money into this sort of project. So, uh, so it was really important that, that we could uh, make some honest assessments about these sort, sorts of questions and say uh, to each of these, yes, we believe uh, that this um, proposal is feasible. Um, and as I say, it wasn't so much about we, we want to kill all these animals just because we like killing little small furry animals. We, we really had a, uh, an ulterior motive, um, and that was that we recognised that the biodiversity on Macquarie Island was severely impacted, and we wanted to give the island uh, a chance to, to restore that uh, original biodiversity, or not necessarily to, to a, a pristine state, but something approaching it, certainly more so than, than uh, it has been in the last couple of hundred years. And um, we wanted to see those um, seabird and vertebrate and, and uh, vegetation populations back to levels where they weren't impacted um, to the same extent. Uh, so we launched in a, a planning phase. Um, even before that, we'd been doing trials on Macquarie Island, testing all sorts of things like uh, bait and uh, throwing it at, at, at all the native bird species to see whether they would touch it and, and things like that. Um, we had a lot of uh, regulatory hurdles uh, to go through. I think we had about 32 different permits and authorities that we needed to, to get. Um, so I'll just flash these up. Uh, they're all things that um, needed to be done to, to, um, before we could e even turn a helicopter blade. So the, the, um, the strategy was effectively two parts. One was to aerially bake the island uh, with a, a, a radenticide. Uh, fortunately, it delivered in a, a format or a bait pellet that rabbits also found palatable. So um, winter of 2010, we started and, and failed because the weather was uh, bloody awful. Um, so we put our tail between our legs and came home um, and went back again in 2011. And the weather was much better and we were able to successfully complete that. We'd, um, we'd, the, ho the whole planning process had been um, predicated on the assumption, uh, and, and that assumption was made based on the experience of previous people who had tried to er eradicate rabbits, that a very small number of rabbits could be expected to survive aerial baiting. So uh, we had a, uh, a large uh, component of the pl planning work had been um, associated with well, how we're we going to deal with these survivors. So after the, um, the roar of helicopter turbines faded into the distance, we had our, um, our field teams uh, with their dogs um, deployed to the island and uh, they spent the, the next three years um, combing the island for any sign of a rabbit. Um, we did indeed find a few survivors and the, uh, the population estimate was around about 150,000 before we started baiting um, and we found eight individuals, uh, eight adult individuals after the baiting. Two of those were female and um, we found one litter of, of kittens. So. Um, I, th I think this is a really salutary point in terms of eradication. If you don't plan and resource to get the last one, you're not really going to achieve anything in the long term. And, and, and those two female rabbits and the, and the one litter of, um, of kittens was enough to start the whole thing all over again. might have taken another 100 years to get to where we are now, but inevitably you would get there with the breeding capacity of rabbits. So I think that, that demonstrated the importance of, um, of, of having the, the sort of planning and resources to make sure that you were able to do the job to the best of your ability. Um, so the project was uh, declared successful earlier this month and uh, the teams came home and, and uh, they've now all uh, headed back to where they came from. But the next couple of slides are just looking at um, so what, is, what have we achieved in, in the uh, three years since the aerial baiting and, and the um, sort of conclusion of the fieldwork. Um, this, uh, the photo on the left is quite uh, remarkable, for, uh, particularly for people who have spent time on Macquarie because it's something that nobody's really seen before and that's um, a whole lot of cobwebs um, in the grass heads. And the reason that people hadn't seen that before was twofold. One is that um, often the grass didn't grow that high because the rabbits ate it off um, or chewed it down. And the second was that uh, probably mice in, in that environment were, uh, were predating uh, spiders very heavily. So. Um, so for those uh, people who have spent time on Macquarie uh, pre-eradication, and, and Sue Robinson, who's uh, uh, 
following me uh, is one who spent a lot of time there in, in the past. We never saw this sort of thing. Um, so that was an early indication of, uh, of, of a, vi a visible yet anecdotal um, uh, outcome as part of that recovery. And uh, the vegetation, the, the Macquarie Island cabbage there in the uh, photo on the right, uh, again, uh, in the last 15 years or so, that's been heavily grazed by rabbits to the point where entire slopes that used to be uh, cabbage clad uh, were just bare dirt, effectively. So uh, seeing this sort of thing coming back within a space of uh, three uh, summer growing seasons has been quite a, a dramatic change. Um, let's bring all these up. There was an explosion pl uh, Closure plot that was built uh, next to a tourist boardwalk in 2006, and uh, these uh, sequence of photos just show the vegetation growing inside that uh, through 2007 and 2008. So you can see that each year, uh, for three years, or actually just two years, the vegetation in inside that plot, uh, without being impacted by rabbits, was able to grow quite well. Uh, and then the final one there, 2013, is, is just two years after the, the baiting, uh, this, and you can barely make out the, uh, the, the star pickets and the wire of the fence uh, in there, but it's in there somewhere. So um, obviously the, the um, release from grazing pressure meant that uh, on the areas outside the, the fence could, could start to recover as well. Um, this one more that will come back, but I just wanted to, uh, to raise a few things uh, about well, what made it a successful project, and I think all of these are, are really important. Uh, another one uh, that I think Stephen mentioned in relation to the goats was that funding uh, to carry it out uh, was critical, and it certainly was for us. We had multi-million dollar contracts for, um, for a lot of things uh, logistics-wise. Uh, that we needed to commit to, and I don't think we could have done that if we had to compete for an annual uh, funding pool uh, with the risk of not getting it. So uh, for us, it, it was absolutely critical that we had a, um, a funding commitment for the whole project so that we could uh, plan with some certainty. Um, again, the, the level of planning was, was um, a very, very high level of detail, and uh, we needed to sort of foresee and, and cover off on pretty much every eventuality and, and things that we'd need. Obviously, 1,500 kilometres away with a ship once a year means that you can't come back to, to Hobart and go down to Mitre 10 if you forget something. So um, we needed to make sure that we had everything with us. Um, there's a group. Um, called the Island Eradication Advisory Group, um, which is uh, made up by uh, members of the Department of Conservation in New Zealand. Uh, they form a, a global uh, resource, if you like, to, to advise uh, project managers on, on eradication uh, strategy and, and operational matters. And they've been involved supporting this project since 2005. Um, with, with regular meetings and, uh, and advice, so uh, that they were able to pull information from other projects that they were advising on and pass that on to us. So that was very valuable for us as well. The, the changing circumstances, uh, an, an example of that is uh, in uh, between 2010 and 2011 uh, winters, uh, we decided to release Khaleesi virus on the island. Uh, that wasn't an attempt to be part of the eradication strategy so much as an attempt to reduce uh, seabird mortality through, um, through scavenging on poison rabbits. Um, so I won't go into the detail due to a bit of lack of time, but that was an example where we thought, OK, well, we've had a, uh, an issue identified, we need to try and do something about it, and, and that was the, uh, the response. Um, the staff, um, both in terms of the planning work uh, back here in Hobart and, uh, and the teams that we had on the island, um, uh, luckily uh, had uh, and needed to have a, a high degree of dedication to uh, achieve the outcomes that we're after. Um, the teams on Macquarie in particular uh, had pretty filthy weather a lot of the time to, uh, to, uh, to contend with. Um, a lot of uh, cold, wet, windy uh, days and they didn't really have the choice of, um, you know, oh, I can't be bothered today. Um, as I said to them each year, you won't find a rabbit sitting in, um, under the bench in your hut. Uh, so if you're going to find them, you have to be out there looking. And snow um, <laughs> is actually a really good uh, scenario for us because uh, there's nothing that shows rabbit tracks better than snow. Um, so that if we encourage them to get out and about as soon as it stops snowing as, as, uh, as a quite a strong part of their, uh, their search effort. Um, I mentioned the island was 34 kilometres long. Uh, the teams collectively in three years, um, they all carried GPSs to track their, their search effort and they covered 92,000 kilometres. Uh, in the course of that um, searching work. I think there might be one more. 
No, there's not. I thought I had another slide uh, in there, but uh, certainly uh, some thanks to, to those people. Uh, I thought I had some photos of Jenny Scott's in there, but I, I must have put those in a different version. Um, but particularly, as I say, the, the teams that did the work on Macquarie um, are really the ones that, uh, I guess, pulled this one off. So thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you.